notably, we have there the strategic advisory board that is a group of 15 high-level experts in the field from science, from industry, but also from research and technology organizations that are, um, I would call it the, 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 the ambassadors, uh, the group that is bringing together all the strategic uh, input that is leading the strategic discussions with the community at large, be it from actors of the community, be it from uh, the, the, the projects, that's where the, um, uh, the input is being uh, compiled and presented uh, towards the um, Board of Funders. Similarly, at what happened a couple of years ago when we created the flagship, where we had this expert group providing recommendations, references of what should be the, the topics to be covered in the flagship, what should be the governance model, the instruments, and so on. So very quickly, the Science and Engineering Board, which is the representative of the flagship uh, projects, um, the chair of that group is Thierry de Böschert from Thales, and we have the vice chair, Stephanie Wehner from uh, QTech. The strategic advisory board, as I mentioned, are a group of 15 high-level experts from industry, research, and uh, RTOs. Uh, it took us a while to set this up. Now we're almost there. We're just waiting for the formal approval of our commissioner on this expert group. Then we can announce it and organize the first meeting of uh, this group and start uh, agreeing and discussing what are now the next um, key questions that this group should uh, lead and uh, organize. And then, of course, the QCN, by my understanding, this is now well established. Maybe Tommaso can uh, confirm, indeed. So normally, each country, be it member state or so to say, to Horizon 2020, has nominated one national representative and I trust that uh, the references, the contact points are publicly available, so if you have a question, you can always also go to them. Very quickly, how do the different uh, bodies of the governance work uh, together? As I described already, the role of the strategic advisory board in really driving, in uh, organizing, in uh, coordinating the um, discussions with the um, community. Uh, it's also this group that regularly will present uh, its findings, ideas, suggestions, uh, whatever, to the board of funders. The chair will regularly attend those meetings to take stock, to present the progress, but also take the um, input from the board of funders uh, for future activities or actions. The Science and Engineering Board, this is mainly to organize the work within the flagship projects. When we have 20 flagship projects running things first October, but they are working uh, as a single entity. It's not 20 individual projects each doing their work in, in isolation. They have a common purpose, they have a common uh, agenda, there are a number of uh, cross-cutting questions that uh, should be addressed uh, together, and this body really brings together those projects to agree and work on the common activities, but also then um, to organize the, uh, and coordinate the uh, input towards the, either the Board of Funders or the Strategic Advisory Board. The Quantum Community Network and any other stakeholders, of course, are there to provide you with the support to participate in the activities of the flagship, even if you're not part of a flagship uh, project. And then really in a meeting like we have uh, this week, in those events, uh, engage in the discussions of what are the, the, the future orientations, what are the common questions to be solved for the flagship, be it the long-term uh, roadmaps, be it benchmarks, uh, be it international cooperation policies, be it the question on how to uh, organize uh, the skills, training, education uh, around uh, the, the flagship and quantum. But also something we have not really started yet is create the link with the, the national program. We have the flagship that was established with a very clear purpose. It's really to drive innovation, to move the results out of the lab into real applications, uh, marketable products, 
concrete uh, applications. But then, of course, there's this whole, uh, um, I'll call it, the need to still do fundamental research, for example. There are some areas we're not covering, uh, also from the innovation side in the flagship. I mean, the resources are finite. So the question is, how are we going to position the flagship uh, together with the national initiatives, the regional initiatives, the other European initiatives, to have a really a coherent and complementary uh, landscape. We're also planning within the flagship to have annual events could, that would take the form of the event we had in Vienna in uh, November, or the shape it uh, has uh, this week, where we'll have a public part where we discuss a number of general policy matters on the flagship together with the, the whole constituency to give you the opportunity to be up to date what's happening in the flagship but also give you the opportunity to contribute to its uh, activities and uh, the shaping of it. And then we have also in parallel a closed part where only we'll have the strategic advisory board coming together or all our projects coming together to discuss internal matters. Now just to give you a, a flavor of how well those uh, events are running. If I take the kickoff event we had uh, in Vienna, I mean, it was the first time the flagship as such came together with the existing uh, projects, where we did a first consultation with the public uh, at large. We started constituting the various governance bodies. And the thing I really want to uh, in highlight, this is the lower part with the numbers. I mean, the event was overbooked. So it was quite well attended. And if you really look now into more detail about who were the participants, you will see that it was m attended by more representatives from people that were not in the projects than attended by projects, which for us is a clear sign that uh, we managed to bring together the projects and the community at large to discuss uh, together what are the future orientations, how to address the challenges of the flagship, etc. Just very quickly, what were the, uh, the outcomes of the, um, the open part? It was organized in a number of work groups, questions about how to contribute to the future challenges, what is the short, mid to long-term roadmap of issues uh, to be addressed. Uh, it was taking stock of also where do we stand with the coverage, the thematic coverage of the current flagship projects where um, are gaps that we would have to, to fill. I will tell you more about that in a couple of slides. There were also some very practical uh, ideas that were discussed, like the need to go more active into what standardization and certification, question about manufacturing, the full supply chain. I mean, if we really want to live to the ambition of creating uh, value creating concrete products applications. We also need to look at uh, all the fabrication aspects. Quite important that we don't create thematic silos, one side theory, one side applications, uh, hardware, software, and so on. The things have to come together. This is what uh, we uh, hope we achieve with the various flagship projects, but we also need to look beyond the projects. And then the question also is, how do we involve other actors than the traditional quantum actors that have been in this area for the last 20 years, if we really want now to build on the excellent science we've been developing in Europe for the last 20 years and create uh, innovation out of that. Now, the, the closed session on the, um, on the flagship projects themselves, as it was the first time they came together, you can imagine they were discussing a number of very down-to-earth practical organizational uh, question. I mean, as you have 20 projects coming together with, I don't know, 100 something different participants, one of the key questions, of course, is protection of intellectual property uh, and how to protect it. So we had a uh, long discussion about that. We had uh, um, guests from the European Patent Office and the IPA Help Desk to assist the projects uh, in the future when those questions come up to properly address those issues. Of course, we were discussing how best to work together across projects to drive together initiative like uh, the flagship. 
And linked to that, as you can imagine, was the collaboration agreement, which fixes the, the way the projects work together. This was probably the most sensitive issue discussed, as for good reasons, the participants do not want that the, the results that they generate sewer, some participant in the, the flagship might leak out somewhere and they cannot uh, uh, benefit from their findings. I mean, this from the very beginning was, even when we conceived the flagship, one of the most critical questions. How to make sure that uh, the results we're generating really stay within Europe and exported there in the first place, so that you do not have a huge investment in resources in developing something very uh, practical, very concrete, that the industrialists really want to uh, put in their uh, production line, that you don't miss this opportunity and the results are then somewhere else in the world uh, taken up. Just for you to know, more than 30% of the flagship participants are coming from the industry, which is quite an achievement. And if you look into more detail in the project, you will see that there is a genuine drive of moving ahead and taking the results out of the lab and bringing them into very practical uh, solutions. Then there were a number of cross-cutting issues uh, discussed. The first one was about benchmarks. We have put an obligation on the projects that work in the same area to compare their results through benchmarks. Let's take the example of quantum computing. We have several platforms uh, that are trying to uh, move closer to a more practical prototype quantum computer. What we want to do is at the end run a benchmark or call it standard application on the different platforms and see how do they compare uh, do they provide, first of all, the same results? I mean, it doesn't make sense if you get random output. Um, so this was the first uh, thing. And then, as we're working on a corporate identity, of course, the question is how do you organize the dissemination communication policy? How does the flagship present itself toward the world? How do we make most uh, out of um, the fact that we have a joint initiative and find a common way of promoting the things we are doing. Now, this is the current status where we're running. Now let me move into what's next. Maybe that might be more interesting um, for, the, for you for the foreseeable future. <coughs> One thing is what we started in, in Vienna is to get more, more concrete, more elaborate, on what are the joint activities that the flagship projects themselves uh, can implement. And this, of course, is coordinated by the strategic, sorry, the science and engineering board of the project. It's identifying common technology challenges and uh, rather than everyone developing the same solution, uh, see how together with a similar challenge you can move ahead more quickly. As we're moving into higher TRLs, of course, the question on engineering, manufacturing is a common need. I mean, one thing is you have a PhD in a lab bringing things together, but if you want to move into mass markets one day, you need now to move into the, the next level, which is engineering. Benchmarking I mentioned, and then any other common challenge like skills need, training, education, uh, et cetera. Now, this is, you might say, down-to-earth management of the flagship. If it comes to forward-looking, to the next steps, this is where the strategic advisory board plays a key role. Now that the ramp-up phase of flagship is running, what next? How do we work afterwards, in 2021? questions about continuity. We have now the, the ramp up running. Now, next phase, we should build on the results of those projects, which does not mean the same projects will just get an extension. I mean, we will do another open call in 2020, 2021 for the uh, next phase. 
open to consortia, but somehow we still want to build on the previous results. So question, how do we achieve this? Question also, as we have seen in the other existing flagships, we regularly get some spin-offs coming out, which, uh, as you might expect, are not uh, predictable. So question is, how do we identify the spin-offs? How do we um, manage them? And what are the support mechanisms? Where can we best place them that they are really getting fertile grounds to develop themselves? Question also about the focus. Where do we want to focus in the future? The current flagship construction is, is rather, uh, I wouldn't say simple, but clearly defined. We have four application areas. We have cross-cutting fundamental science. Question is, should it remain like that in the future? Should we focus on a particular area and drop the others because they are no longer relevant or because they are too mature or done somewhere else? Should we uh, put more resources in one than the other? I mean, all these questions for the moment are unresolved, but we need to sort them out in the next six to 12 months, not more than that, to prepare the next phase, to prepare the next uh, work programs after Horizon 2020. And then, of course, a question which is vital, how is the flagship positioned with all the other quantum initiatives that are running in Europe? To create synergies, to avoid unnecessary overlaps, to really maximize the, um, the, the joint investments. And then, of course, a question that comes back and back and back is the shortage of, of skills, the educational profiles we need, and now we're moving greatly out of pure quantum physics, moving into other disciplines. Question is, do we have the right people and are our curricula enabling us to fill the uh, skills gap and the needs of the labor market? Now, this is something that is uh, under discussion uh, and we hope to close the discussion in the next the couple of months, is a complementary flagship call. When we did the analysis of the running projects, building also on the discussions we had in Vienna, it became evident that on the quantum computing side, we are not investing enough. We have two quantum computing projects working on two different qubit uh, platforms, um, but investment there was not enough, and also uh, we would like have additional approaches for the qubit platform. There was also uh, a concern that on the application side, on the software side, we were a bit low. Even if all the quantum computing projects include a software development component, uh, there is room for having something uh, more integrated and uh, at a higher level. That's why we're now working on launching in 2020 for the, sorry, for the work program 2020, another complementary call on quantum computing where there will be two uh, FOSI. Is it FOSI, FOCI? Focus, focus times two? <laughs> First one is another quantum computing uh, project building on the semiconductor-based platform, an approach compatible with mass manufacturing microelectronics. The idea here is really to move closer to uh, engineering, mass manufacturing, small-scale integration for processes that are well understood in the microelectronics industry so that we have really the perspective of not only scalable qubit platforms, but platforms that at the end can be produced in very large volumes at very low cost. We are thinking about the project of around 15 million euros there to be complemented by another project of around 5 million euros that would be targeting uh, development of applications, software for quantum computing uh, and so on, independent of any technical platform. This is complemented with another round for Quantera, which was uh, very successful so far. So the idea is just to uh, expand this. And then finally, as international cooperation is uh, a hot topic and uh, we have been getting pressure for quite some while now, we're launching 
or propose to launch another support action that would uh, help us uh, as a flagship define the, the policy, the instruments, uh, on what topics to work together with which region in the world and so on. Now this is indicative, so don't s start writing your proposal before the, the call is, uh, of course, adopted. Plan is to have the call published around the end of this year so that the projects can start in 2020. And we hope to have an agreement uh, before the summer with the program committee. Now this is the immediate future. Now let's look beyond Horizon 2020. Now this is, of course, still under negotiation before all the legal documents have been agreed with Council, Parliament. A number of the uh, ideas I'm putting here are still uh, indicative or speculative. The one thing we know now for sure is that Digital Europe program, which will be one of the main areas that we'll be working in, has been agreed with Council last week. So Digital Europe program is established. Now we have to work on the specific program, the specific uh, components, and there is also uh, something about quantum. There's also a broad agreement that the quantum flagship should continue in Horizon Europe. Horizon Europe is, to simplify the continuation of Horizon 2020, it's a research-oriented uh, program where we develop a technology. Uh, uh, the quantum flagship receives a huge support from the member states uh, to continue, so we're quite confident it will continue. The consensus now, if you look into the political documents debate, it's uh, firmly anchored in the legislation, but before it's adopted, you never know what can happen, but we are very confident it will take place. The Digital Europe program, on the other hand, this is an infrastructure program. It's a capability program. We're not doing any research there. That's where we will deploy the, the systems. That's where we will um, provide access to the machines. Just to give you the examples we're currently discussing and um, which where the discussions are, uh, are making good progress, one idea is to create a European quantum key distribution network spanning the, the whole union based on a terrestrial network with connection to satellite to uh, add another layer of security for digital networks, providing public key exchange and other services, applications that you can run with the sharing of uh, uh, quantum keys. This is rather well uh, accepted as, as an idea is moving uh, quite well ahead, and this will build on the QKD pilot that we, we just selected and hope to start in the next few months. Of course, we're not only looking for an infrastructure part for the QKD, we're also um, contemplating in uh, taking advantage of the quantum world to keep increasing the computing powers of the supercomputers uh, in the Union. We are now running a big initiative, which I happen also to have the honor to lead, is high performance computing. And if you look into the legislation there that sets the base, it's already written, okay, we have another generation of classical computers, exascale in 2022, but we should also work on the post-exascale, which includes quantum. It's explicitly mentioned there. We have a number of flagship projects now that are working on the fundamental concepts who, to build those uh, machines. So we hope that in 2025 we can put into service the first uh, hybrid machines that would include quantum accelerators. On top of that, an idea that uh, we are uh, pushing forward is to build experimental quantum computing infrastructures where you would have a facility with, I don't know, four or five experimental uh, quantum computing platforms, which would be accessible to any user uh, in Europe just to run his code, to test his algorithm, uh, to build his uh, future concept without having to build in his own house, again, another quantum computing platform. A bit in analogy what we're doing in high performance computing in making available large and costly computing infrastructure for the users uh, across the union to really run their codes test their program, do the simulation, whatever they, they want to run, 
and those computing facilities uh, provide all the resources just to run the machine. So you just come with your, your problem, your calculation, your code, whatever, and there's a whole team behind that runs it for you and you get the results back. Now, of course, we see there uh, a feedback loop. The flagship is maturing new components, new technologies, new applications that will gradually feed into the Digital Europe program to really move ahead with the deployment of the, the systems. If I take a very simple example about the QKD networks, we don't have quantum repeaters for the moment, so we will build quantum network with current day technology, but maybe in three years, four years, five years, when this round of flagship projects comes to maturity, we'll have more elaborate, uh, more network components that gradually will uh, be implemented in these networks and uh, uh, come to really the quantum computing internet. Just quickly on the, the timeline, I mean, as I said, this is indicative because you never know how the discussions go at the uh, political level. We are counting on getting a political agreement on the framework text uh, before the summer. On Digital Europe program, we, we, we got it. Horizon Europe is still uh, being negotiated, but uh, coming soon to an end. What is to start then, and the reflections are already uh, popping up, is the strategic programming. The strategic programming is, uh, I would not call it an instrument, but something that is being uh, so included in the way Horizon Europe is set up. It's defining the high level orientations of where should this particular field go. In our case, it would be quantum, bringing together uh, the various uh, actors, stakeholders, if they know only quantum or beyond, to really define the long-term vision, the goals to be met, on what topics uh, to focus. And then based on this strategic programming, we start developing the first work programs. So normally the discussions on the work programs, at least in-house, would start towards the end of the year to then move into the negotiation phase with uh, the program committees, with the uh, stakeholders, beginning of, of next year to have the calls, really the first calls published by summer, the latest September 2020, so that, you know, first proposals could be submitted in the first quarter of 2021 to uh, create the next phase of the flagship. Now, this is the current indicative timeline. We'll see how it uh, moves. Now, I discussed previously the positioning of the quantum technologies flagship with respect of the national programs, but there are many other initiatives uh, around where we are looking actively to have uh, synergies to find uh, good ways of uh, working together. I mentioned the QKD pilot we have in mind, sorry, the QKD network we have in mind. We're already now discussing very closely since some time, and it's really picking up with the space programs be it Galileo, be it ESA. <coughs> we have other multinational initiatives like Quantera that is complementing very nice what we're doing in the flagship and we hope we can expand this in the future. The other activities on the sensing side, we have the cost action, so at the end we really should come together and have a very well structured ecosystem where each of the initiatives has a very specific focus is targeting one part of the overall landscape, but working in good synergy with all the other quantum initiatives uh, that are happening in Europe. Now this, I, I'm, I'm skipping, this is just uh, what I said before on the uh, quantum communication infrastructure, just uh, one more slide. This is on the hybrids with uh, quantum, this is also what I described before, just here to recap the timelines and the relation uh, with the different uh, programs. Now again, this is 
what we are working on, but before it's in the legal text, uh, things can still be adapted. Now, the last slides I would really like to present to you are what are now the, the hot topics, the real issues we would like to discuss with the quantum community at large. I've just listed here what are for us the key questions. I'm not saying we have an answer to those. It can go either way, uh, but that's where now we need your input for the next uh, foreseeable future and where we're really counting on your active participation. Questions like what is the appropriate structure for implementing the, the flagship in its next phase? Do we continue as we are doing it now? Are there better approaches? Should we go for a formal partnership agreement? Uh, one big uh, single project? Uh, whatever. We have set up a governance which under the current conditions, under the way the flagship is structured, serves a purpose. Question in the future, will the same structure still be valid? Taking also into consideration that the whole flagship construction might change. So what is the appropriate governance for the future? Now, we are running the flagship through Horizon 2020 with 20 uh, projects following the normal Horizon 2020 model grantor agreement. Is this the way it should happen still in the future? Or will Horizon Europe give us other possibilities to implement it? Question also is if we really manage to uh, live up to our, our ambition and expand significantly into the Digital Europe program, is construction like we have today appropriate to coordinate all these activities and make sure that we have cross-fertilization between the two? I already mentioned continuity. For us, it's a nonsense if in three years we launch a call, start with new projects, new ideas, and just put everything we had previously in the bin. The, the flagship is built in phases, so if now we're developing um, for, uh, reasons of argument, small quantum processors, the next phase would be, okay, we bring the processors together to build the prototype computer. So the next phase, we're not going back and saying, let's develop other processors. No, we take processors and, and move into the next step. And then also a question we have not uh, sorted out, how does the flagship position itself vis-a-vis -vis the national programs and vice versa? Now, the, the top question on this slide is something that is gaining rapidly in political importance, and uh, we'll see much more of this in the future. It's not only for quantum. This is cutting across all high-tech areas. We are developing in, in the union a number of, of key technologies like quantum, high performance computing, AI, cyber security, photonics, or whatever, where there's a strategic and economic interest to keep this in the union. Not only the knowledge and competence, but also the, the fabrication uh, and associated questions. So how can we make sure that quantum remains a priority in Europe and that we can really uh, take advantage and cash in on the hundreds of millions that we have and are going to invest in this field. And finally, uh, something we uh, uh, will have to address at a much more structured level is the, the skills training and education question. For the moment, what we can do until the end of Horizon 2020 with the help of the support actions, we can take stock of uh, the skills gap, the training offers, uh, devising what uh, should be the future curricula, but we don't have the means really to implement this. In the Digital Europe program in the future, however, there's a dedicated priority for, I think it's 800 million that are planned just on digital skills, where we're counting on taking a large part to put this to quantum. So question is, if we get, I don't know, 100 million or, or more for addressing the skills and training issue in quantum, how to implement this, where to focus, uh, what is uh, the relation with, the, the, of course, the, the national education uh, ministries that have the competence there. So all these are for us key questions which 
I now invite all of you to participate to help us uh, identifying and shaping. Thank you for your attention, and I suppose afterwards there can be questions. Yes, thank you so much. Thank you for your effort and effort from your team. <laughs> yes, maybe you have some question we could have now. Um, feel free to ask to have me. Hi, um, Enrique Solano from Bilbao, Spain. I, um, I, I know that we should not perhaps put too much weight on each sentence you said. But uh, I am a little worried uh, concerning the issue of uh, a second phase of the flagship, mostly going ahead with the previous efforts. Um, quantum computing is, is at a very early stage, and I would say that we need uh, not only plan A, but plan B, C, and there should be a chance for alternative quantum computing paradigms, or quantum annealing, neuromorphic quantum computing, merged digital analog versions, uh, and, and in case also the platforms we are, we are developing require adjustments, we would need also uh, not to start from zero, but I think we need to broaden a little bit the possibilities because uh, it's high gain, high risk, and quantum computing I think should be boosted, but, but we need a certain flexibility in, uh, in, in that direction, so thanks. Yeah. No, thank you for the question. I mean, it's um, very um, opportune that you uh, pose it. Let me give a very simple example. We now have I mean, just for sake of argument, a uh, flagship project with a quantum computing platform based on ions. I don't know, they can entangle 15 ions. Now they're working for the next three years. Okay, with those 15 entangled ions, what can I develop as higher level quantum computing uh, concepts and moving closer towards uh, a quantum prototype computer? Now, it could be that by laws of physics, you might not go beyond 20 entangled ions. So we will know that this is not the platform of the future. However, in the meantime, it allowed us to move the next step, to develop the compilers, the software, the others. We go to the next phase. We launch a call, say, now you have to demonstrate 100 qubit error corrected platform that will run all these codes. Ions might not be competitive. But some other quantum platform approach that we didn't have in any of our projects has reached a maturity level Say, okay, I can do that. So we're not looking anymore what is the underlying platform, but you know, can you solve the next issue? That's why I'm talking about the continuity. Now, if this platform, of course, can scale up to thousands of, of qubits, they still have that chance. Now, but we're not just throwing one part away or just saying, okay, you got the first project, we'll continue in your direction. Thank you. Other question? Yes? Um, you propose to uh, have a call for the semiconductor fabrication. My question is how industry w uh, in Europe would react to this. We have basically no semiconductor industry left here in Europe. Yes, we still have a semiconductor industry. We have uh, Infineon, we have STM, uh, among others. Uh, we also have a number of uh, smaller fabs that are running uh, smaller um, production lines. We have a number, even at the uh, union level, support actions to help you find the foundries for, for small scale, more um, uh, specialized uh, components. Um, we will see how the market reacts. We already know from now that there's a huge interest by uh, the industrialists and by the countries that uh, are hosting those enterprises to uh, move into that direction. And this is not only linked to the quantum, but it's linked to the much higher level debate in bringing back the whole manufacturing of uh, key microelectronics component back to Europe. This is what uh, I indicated when we're talking about strategic technology and how to keep this uh, in Europe. Uh, it, there's a whole debate going on on the over micro and electronics industry uh, in the Excel joint undertaking, uh, in uh, photonics, in, in cybersecurity. There are discussions on maybe we need to change the union law so that like other regions the world do, the government can put billions into the building of the fabs 
in the, in the territory, so that we really keep the strategic competences and can build those components. Uh, we have the same debate in high-performance computing, where we're now in the investing billions just to redevelop a European microprocessor that can compete with the Intel. Uh, with at the end, the question, where are we going to uh, manufacture them? For the moment, we don't have the capacity uh, in Europe, so maybe the first generation we will use a global foundry, but the, we are already discussing with the, the governments, the heads of state, okay, in the future, if we bring all those components together, we need dedicated manufacturing capacities ramped up in Europe. Thanks. David Chioff, Best Insight. Uh, Horizon Europe, my understanding, is to contain a series of uh, one or more missions to mobilize high-level uh, visibility. Uh, can you comment more on the prospect of one or more of those being uh, quantum-related? Um, and don't quote me in, uh, in the press. Up to my knowledge, quantum will not be a mission. Quantum will be a, a flagship. Now, the discussion is how and where is this uh, positioned in the Horizon Europe text. Uh, the concept of the mission applies to other technologies. The last documents I've seen, quantum is no longer a mission, but quantum stays as a flagship. And there's a clear support from the heads of state to keep the flagship in Horizon Europe. Okay. I'm from Technical University of Vienna. I have a question uh, about uh, sensor and metrology, because you told a lot about uh, quantum computing, but uh, what should we do in sensing and metrology? To which direction should we move? Thank you. Yes. I, I didn't want to downplay the role importance of uh, the sensing. We have in the flagship now a large um, number of projects addressing this. Uh, we'll keep uh, doing this uh, in the future. So far, the, the area that looks the most mature in TRL level is uh, the sensing part. For us now, the, the question is, and that's where we're counting on your contribution, can we build a large initiative on sensing metrology like we're planning on the QKD, on the quantum computing, etc.? How and where do we justify uh, such an effort? Question, is it in three years still necessary to have this in the quantum flagship? I don't know. This is now the answers we would like to get from you, is how we can build on, on that part and address it at the right uh, level that we can really uh, take advantage and build the markets, the applications that are uh, residing or built on the, the sensing part. But for the moment, we have no concrete uh, ideas and as I said, that's what we're hoping on your input. Other question now? If not, thank you again, Gustav. So let us welcome Tommaso Calarco. I have to stay to stand here. Oh well, okay. So um, I, I, yes, can I have that? Because I left the one down. There we go. Um, does it work? How long? Yes. Okay. So um, I don't know if it works because I don't hear, but I did my test. Hopefully you can hear. So well. Um, Hello. Yes. Wonderful. Um, so, uh, well, <coughs> so it's a pleasure to be here. Thanks a lot to Eve and all the, the people here <coughs> in Grenoble who are organizing this big thing, which of course, as any big event, is, is a major uh, achievement just to get it running. Um, what I decided is to give up half of my uh, coordination action presentation for, or more than half, for Marcus, because Marcus is going to be the boss in the future. 
So I am trying to be uh, as short as possible with uh, some, some summary of what we have done, and all that is going to come in the future is what, uh, um, in the next coordination action, Q flag, Marcus will explain. And <coughs> I will also be able to take maybe a little more explicitly uh, a few questions, but maybe uh, after for the open floor, about than, than Gustav has, uh, could do, because of course he gave us the official view. And if you wish, I, I mm, should be able to give you a uh, less official uh, uh, view of what is going to happen in the future. And I, I'm going to address that also in the afternoon when we talk about governance. So here is a brief summary of what we did with the quantum support action, our coordination action, which was tasked with preparing uh, you know, the different elements to get the flagship up and running. So we are here, so the governance structure has been established, and now you know, we are starting and looking already forward towards Horizon Europe. And I will go on, come back to that also, as I said, in the afternoon. So um, in one month, now this coordination action, which was very short, only one year and a couple months, will uh, stop, and then the Q flag will start for the next three years. So what did we do? Well, uh, I am putting this here not only uh, because, okay, we did these events, uh, the kickoff in, the, in, in Oberkochen at Zeiss and then the, the Vienna flagship meeting, but also to because, uh, I mean, what Gustav has explained really goes along the direction of what we already discussed. So he said, you know, there is now Horizon Europe, but there is also the program Digital Europe. He addressed, for instance, the need for skills. What would we do if we had, you know, uh, uh, 100 millions to, to enable the skills for, for quantum? All of these questions, actually, if you remember, were addressed in this meeting in Oberkochen, and actually we have prepared a document where all your input came in, and we delivered it to the Commission, and Gustav had the very uh, positive words for this, and actually they said that it has been really a, mm, a basis for some of the reflections that they, they are doing. And this is really coming from the community in the sense that, for instance, the education part, right? Okay, so it started a little bit there. It was more or less improvised based on a phone call, funny phone call that we got at, uh, I think, uh, for Frank Wilhelm, it was 4 a.m. in the morning in California, and so we did something very quickly. But then, you know, it grew, and actually based on input from the community, for instance, there is this community for physics education, um, which are organizing a, a sort of mini symposium, two days in which they are really going in detail into that. So we created a, an additional working group on education. So this is really something which is moving. And not only we are creating papers, but we are delivering those papers to the commission. They are asking for that and they use this for all the, the things that they do afterwards. So this is really something which, uh, in which uh, our input of everybody is very important also in terms of the governance because this is going to flow into the work of the Science and Engineering Board and the Strategic Advisory Board. So uh, Gustav already mentioned uh, we have a very fancy company which uh, makes the template for us, uh, which is in some very good color scheme and, and, uh, and uh, fonts, uh, but it is completely unreadable. In any case, uh, uh, so and it is very expensive too, but uh, uh, so in any case, uh, well, there are many names here, so it, uh, uh, the point is if you want to know, as Gustav mentioned, who is the representative, there is one main uh, representative in the quantum community network per country, as Gustav mentioned, and in most countries <coughs> there is, and I should say that I am still late because I should also get my deputy. We are discussing with, with industry to get an industry deputy for Germany, but in most countries there is a deputy. So those are the people which in first line in your country are uh, you know, in charge with trying and bring people together, hear the voice of the community, bring this into the, into the flagship, and the in, at, at the level of the gov flagship governance, I mean, um, and really trying to make uh, programs uh, on quantum technologies grow and develop in each of the countries of the European Union. And we have seen amazing examples of that, not only the usual suspects, but also in, in smaller countries, uh, which really are stepping into this, uh, this process. I will give more details about the activity of this quantum community network this afternoon when we have the session about governance. So another important uh, group is the research agenda working group. Now, there are a lot of people who are asking, can we contribute to that? And uh, yes, uh, the names here are just the names of the people who do the legwork. So the names of the people who, you know, really take everybody's input and put it into documents. So <coughs> these are, uh, you know, divided in the different uh, uh, areas, which were in the first call. This is building on what once upon a time was known as our virtual institutes. Those are essentially people who volunteer to do work to get the input from everybody in the community and uh, feed it into the governance bodies and the commission to shape the next calls. For instance, 
you know, when several people in the community expressed their concern that um, uh, as a result of the flagship call, the um, semiconductor quantum computing and also software was not uh, uh, there, actually we conveyed input and also ideas on how to, to do that and the commission took it. Something very exceptional happened because normally, I mean, this is technicalities, but typically what happens is, you know, you have the framework program, every two years you have a work program, so-called, and then you have the calls. And then once this work program is set, uh, typically you don't change it anymore. So it was very exceptional that the commission acknowledged, again, our input when we said there are a few topics which have not been uh, regarded uh, sufficiently, and uh, they took it and they changed the work program during, you know, the, the, the period in which it normally doesn't happen, and what they did is they added a, a new call on this, which is a flagship call. So again, you see that this is not just about you know, future things or some bureaucratic stuff. It is about some very concrete things that are happening. I know there, is, there was a concern also concerning quantum communication. Now there is this, this uh, uh, new call uh, which has just closed, as Gustav mentioned, and maybe we could perhaps hope that maybe the budget for that could even be a little bit bigger than what we uh, were told in the beginning. So once again, this conference is a moment for all of us, uh, and also in the future, to you know, uh, bring together expertise and give input to move things forward. So, <coughs> well, the first version of the flagship uh, strategic research agenda was, was published, uh, and so and there is uh, uh, a lot of initiatives also in the future. There is, for instance, a, a, a workshop on quantum simulation, which we are running uh, uh, at the end of this year. Uh, to bring again together industry and, and academia to define, I mean, what is it, uh, benchmarking, what are the applications which are relevant there. Um, connected to this, there are also, and we have also a session here about standardization. So all of these uh, aspects are coming together in these uh, working groups. So if your name is not there, it doesn't mean that you are not expected and welcome to contribute to that. Those people are just the people who are taking up the work to do it. So <coughs> same goes for the innovation working group. Well, one, I would say, as far as I'm concerned, the largest concern that we see that we have here in Europe is that the involvement of industry is uh, by far not yet comparable to what we see, for instance, in the United States. So we really would need a lot more involvement there. And uh, this is one of the reasons why we established this uh, innovation working group, which, and here are the names of the people who are involved, and again, this has the, the purpose of proposing, thinking and proposing measures on how to really, you know, come and not miss the train, because scientifically we are certainly not missing the train, but, uh, you know, on, uh, if I look at investment from big companies such as Google, IBM, uh, Intel, Microsoft, and so on, I mean, there is a concern there. So this is the, ma the major uh, challenge, I would say, that we face, and so the role of this innovation working group, which is new because the research agenda working group with the virtual institute existed already before, but this one has a very important role in this context. Okay, so there were, uh, um, in the context of this innovation working group, but also the research agenda working group, there were some initiatives for international cooperation. So we had a workshop in Paris, uh, stimulated by a request from Japan. So the Japanese Minister for Science came to the commission asking for cooperation on quantum technology. So we had uh, this, this workshop uh, discussing possible priorities. Recently, I was uh, um, at the White House uh, in, in December, and also Jürgen Blinek uh, was there, uh, I think, last week. Um, and they are very interested in uh, cooperation on the basic science, on the fundamental science level. So also the uh, commission has asked us to, to establish this. So we put together um, under the leadership of Rob Few, who is the leader of the uh, SRE working group, we put together a document which should serve as the basis for possible joint calls in the future. And more is to come. So we are discussing with Canada and with, with, with other countries. So, well, the governance structure has already been mentioned. Here, I mean, it's just a placeholder, if you wish, because we have a, a session on that this afternoon, but just to, to show that, you know, we did our homework. So we had one year to set up all of this uh, this, uh, these bodies and these mechanisms, and now they are there, they are running. Actually, the, SRA, the uh, SAB is not yet up and running. There are some, some glitches still, uh, and which uh, I hope will be fixed soon. But I mean, this is the, the, the structure as we envision this in terms of the terms of reference that we have on our website, especially for concerning the, the Quantum Community Network Board, which is one of the three bodies for the governance. Uh, and again, this is something which the role of the coordination action, and the next one is going to have the, the important role of functioning as a secretariat for that. 
So, <coughs> well, we also put together this, this portal with uh, this nice visual identity, which many of you are using, so I don't have to, to mention that more. One thing I would like to mention, the Curop website and the Curop mailing list, which all we are all used to, somehow are undergoing a transition, so they, will, they are going to be uh, replaced, and uh, formally they are already replaced by the QT.eu uh, portal, mailing list, and so on. I know that some people, uh, you know, at some point were a little confused because both websites were alive at the same time, so it was not clear, and so on and so forth. So the statement is, we have this new portal, now it is up and running with full functionality. When we were in Vienna, it was not yet the case, so now we have all the functionality. We can use it, and so I think we have completed the migration of everything onto that. So don't expect to get any Curop, dot, uh, Curop uh, uh, mailing list uh, mails anymore. In the future, it will just be the same function fulfilled by this, uh, uh, by this portal. Good. So we also have uh, you know, uh, uh, developed uh, our presence at different events, uh, in, uh, for instance, at the ICT conference in, in Vienna, which is maybe something which is not, not so familiar to us, but it is the big conference for, for all things uh, information technology for the European Commission, and we were very present there. Another uh, nice thing is that the Mobile World Congress, next week we will be in Barcelona, so we have a, a, our stand there in a very prominent position for the first time, and so we are also sort of getting into more mainstream events such as uh, MWC. So this is again something that uh, we have started with the coordination action, and the next one is going to, to push forward. So of course there is this conference which uh, you know, we, are, we, are, we are funding, and uh, I should also say, so this is for me an opportunity to thank Eve specifically, not just as in a standard way you would say because he organized everything and so on and so forth, but the very amazing thing is that he volunteered, he really volunteered, because no normally for doing these things you are volunteered. Yeah? In this case he really volunteered, which is amazing, and the more amazing thing is that he did without budget because he is not even in the coordination action, okay? And in fact, but in fact, uh, I mean, somehow, I mean, we, we don't realize it anymore because uh, since uh, several months, almost one year, we are really working together with the new coordination action and the old one to make sure that there is complete continuity and there is no, no, uh, no glitch for, for any of us. So now, I mean, essentially, we will not notice uh, when it will happen. It will just be a relief for me because I will have to do much less legwork and Marcus is going to take that, that up, but uh, somehow, you know, please rest assured that even though names uh, are changing a little bit, which I think is also healthy in terms of our rotation of roles in our community, that it's not always the same people, the same institution which do things, but uh, this is evolving, but uh, please rest assured that there will be complete continuity and it will be all very, very smooth. Uh, since I promised it would be quick, so here is the end, and uh, this is just the, uh, our, our old team, uh, old in the sense that, uh, you know, uh, these uh, were some of the people who have accompanied the, uh, the, the our community since many, many years. I'm thinking, for instance, of Daniele uh, in Trento and Rob, and, you know, new additions re more recently, uh, uh, Thierry, but also, but also Frank and Thomas, and some of them are going on as members of the SCB, as coordinators of flagship projects. Uh, Thierry even uh, is going to be the chair of the uh, Science and Engineering Board, and more people are coming in, which Marcus is going to introduce to you. Uh, in the next talk. Thanks. So good morning, everybody. Uh, as Tomato said, my name is Markus Wilkins, uh, and I'm the next uh, the coordinator of the next uh, coordination and support action uh, called QFLAG. Uh, I probably some people know me because uh, I'm also involved in another initiative. It's called Photonics 21. Uh, it's a uh, European technology platform uh, in the photonics, and I'm coordinating this uh, for many years. So now I'm new to the field of quantum. And uh, I must say that uh, I was amazed how enthusiastic uh, this community is running already. And uh, we are taking over 
uh, really well structured uh, activity from Tommaso and the whole team. And as Tommaso said, uh, for about one year we are already participating in the telco so that uh, we believe we'll get a flying start for the QFLAG project. So before I talk about uh, the QFLAG project uh, in more detail, I want to present to you this picture which says, basically has two key messages in my view. First, the quantum flagship is deeply rooted into basic science, but at the same time it is also very clear, and we heard that from Gustav, that 30% uh, that, uh, of the project participants are coming from industry. It, is, it has also a very strong focus on application. And uh, <coughs> we had an initiative some years ago, it called a Key Enabling Technology Con Initiative, and Quantum certainly belongs today to this Key Enabling Technology uh, for Europe, where it was said the major challenge in Europe is to move from lab to fab. We are traditionally very strong in the, in the uh, science field, uh, transferring these results into products, uh, Europe in the past was not so strong, and we need to change that. So on, uh, on the knowledge field, we generate a lot of world-leading stuff, and now we need to uh, bring in RTOs, which can really make the uh, technology research and the engineering. We need to bring in companies who can transfer these results into uh, prototypes into pilot deployment and pilot lines and in the end we need to and want to establish a competitive manufacturing in Europe. So this is our aim for the flagship and uh, we as QFLAG uh, <coughs> try to support this activity in a way we can and to bring together all the loose ends uh, in the quantum flagship, so the different projects, the different initiatives in order to, uh, to come to this target to this goal. Uh, also already mentioned by Gustav, there is a specific European challenge. Of course, we are competing against uh, many other economies like uh, China and the US, and I think a New York Times uh, uh, article I recently read uh, talked about uh, the Cold War on deep technologies. Uh, it was mainly mentioned uh, uh, between the US and China. Uh, we do have a specific challenge in Europe. Uh, we say, okay, there will be this one billion investment in, in uh, quantum technologies. But of course, if you look deeper, there are several countries doing these investments. And it's a huge effort to, to try to streamline and to uh, focus these investments to a common goal. And that's certainly uh, one of our main uh, actions that we try to prepare and implement a tru truly European uh, quantum strategy involving all member states who are doing these investments in order to make it most efficient. So the QFLAG CSA project. So Tommaso just uh, showed to you the, uh, the uh <coughs> QSA a consortium this year is the QFLAG consortium. Probably I can ask my fellow colleagues to just stand up so that you see them. They're all here, I believe. So what I've seen, I think Rob is the only one which, uh, which stays in consortium. Others have moved to, uh, as a coordinator to a project uh, or are now uh, active in a different role, like Tommaso is for the QCN. Um, and next to the people you see by picture, there are many more, of, for instance, my colleague Claudius Klein, who's supporting me in the coordination role, but also Lydia Sanmati and Alina Hirschmann from ICFO and Thomas Strom from Bosch. Oh, Thomas is uh, also in the QSA. So the QFLAG, in a nutshell, is supposed to provide the central services to the EU quantum flagship. And uh, as Gustav said, we would like to do that uh, by involving the whole quantum community. So it will not be sufficient to have a few uh, projects funded. Uh, no, we need to involve the whole community and start a movement in Europe, really. And there has been a lot of work of the previous uh, uh, coordination actions done in order to establish this community, and I will come to that in a minute. We 
in order to build trust and, uh, and engage the people, we need to make sure that there is an efficient operation and that there are open and transparent decision-making processes so that everybody of you knows uh, what uh, will happen with my contribution to the whole process. The key deliverable, of course, is a strategic research agenda, so a roadmap, so where should uh, the quantum technology has had to in the next 10 years from now, and you should be part of it. And of course, the Q flag will act as a single entry point to the flagship. It will be the mouthpiece also of the community to the European Commission in a way, and it will uh, manage the central communication platform and uh, propose the key performance indicators to the individual boards and to the Commission uh, in terms of the overall flagship, but also. Uh, the benchmarks for individual technology platforms, and the work on this has already started. And in the end, and this comes back to my uh, second slide, uh, QFLAG is here to establish or help establishing uh, quantum technology supply chain in Europe for industrial deployment. So this is the aim of the QFLAG. So, Building up this uh, quantum community organization, there has been a lot of work done in the last years, uh, uh, often through personal networks, and as I said, it's a very vibrant community. We now want to put it into, let's say, uh, we want to establish it in a more structured way. And uh, together with QSA, we have already prepared uh, the so-called terms of reference, where it is clearly described who is doing what, who has which responsibility, and who on, and how people can engage with the quantum flagship through this quantum flagship community organization. It's important to note that this is free of charge for everybody, so everybody can participate. And uh, when you're participating through this organization, you will get a hold on the strategic research agenda, agenda work. You can contrib contribute there. Uh, I'm pretty sure that we also be asked uh, about research innovation priorities, so which topics, what topics to call for. So this would be proposed uh, to the uh, Strategic Advisory Board and they will discuss about it and then propose it to the European Commission. And of course, education and training, how can we connect uh, the initiatives ongoing in the different countries. So please register yourself uh, at qt.eu and uh, become part of this. This is... Uh, probably not so well readable. Um, we already have about uh, 1,800 participants or members, however you would call it. Most of them are coming uh, from universities, as you would expect, but we also have uh, quite some numbers coming from RTOs already and from companies. So this is, I think, a very good start for the ramp-up phase, and uh, personally, I believe that we can even double the numbers, and over time, we hope that we involve more and more RTOs, more and more co companies. So I'm pretty happy with what we have here, except one thing. The uh, distribution between male and female is, uh, is quite awful, I must say, and uh, we uh, only have less than 20% uh, females uh, in this organization, and uh, this we, are, we need to change, and we take that very, very serious. So, coming to the, let's say, more concrete stuff we're going to do, uh, it's on quantum flagship strategy and monitoring, we will prepare the strategic research agenda, and the work group ha has already been established, the editor teams are established, and the proposal process will start uh, pr pretty soon. We'll adapt the definition of the technology readiness levels to the quantum technology and the benchmarking, which is already ongoing. And coming back to the last slide, uh, we are taking serious to, to go for gender equality initiatives, and there's also a work group planned on that. So now we are coming to the innovation markets, and uh, we want to move towards an engineering and system approach. So uh, we want to identify the research and prototype, the research infrastructure and prototyping equipment, which is already available, uh, and also what additional uh, equipment and infrastructure is needed to connect industry to the flagship. We want to identify the challenges for scalability. So if you have developed a, a prototype, 
what needs to be done in order to scale up, to go to manufacturing. Uh, we want to establish an information exchange platform to trigger the transfer from academia to industry. So if you have a result, uh, this should be made available to, to potential industry partners. And we want to uh, identify quantum technology use cases uh, in two fields. First, where ultimate performance is key. So you could think about uh, the European Space Agency, uh, Space Agency as a customer but also the mass market. And uh, for this, we have on one hand CEA, and on the other hand Bosch as a partner, so I think a perfect choice. And of course, and this was already uh, uh, mentioned as well, it's the IP management, which will stay an important issue for us, I think. For the education and training, we will, and this is what we can do in the first, in the ramp-up phase, to collect and promote the, the education training offerings across Europe in order to get an overall picture of what is present there. We will identify the needs and the gaps, and we will propose new curricula. And uh, Gustav just said in the future there will be huge investments made by the Commission and also the Member States, I think, uh, in this area, and we would provide the blueprint what needs to be done. Uh, and then, of course, the flagship gets taxpayers' money, and, uh, and we need to explain how and why this taxpayers' money is spent. And uh, not only to the general public, but also to the research community and to the industry. And we have quite ambitious goals uh, with our, let's say, PR and communication strategy, which is mainly uh, uh, taken care of by ICFO, uh, to reach a global leaders a readership of, of about 3 million readers. Uh, and uh, through partnering exhibition sites, uh, we want to address 1 million visitors in order to bring across the message about quantum technologies. So, and last but not least, uh, it's about coordinating the, the European quantum flagship with uh, the member states' investments. So uh, we need to establish uh, continuous cooperation schemes with member states. We have already the Quantera, which is a good start, I think. But we could think about going beyond that even, right? This could remain and will remain important. But would there be, for instance, Eureka models where, let's say, some member states can cooperate and make joint investments on specific things? Uh, will that be possible? We will look into that and we will try to trigger member states also together with the QCN uh, network to think in that direction. Uh, we will, <coughs> we will uh, start a benchmarking uh, of the EU strategy against uh, other competing economies and uh, I foresee that there will be a close uh, cooperation with the newly established CSA on international cooperation. And, uh, of course, one of our key tasks is to ensure a smooth operation uh, between the individual bodies of the uh, platform. And you have seen these pictures two times already. I think the Q flag uh, is the secretariat of the flagship. It will act as a central switchboard, so it will put the glue to the, to the different bodies and exchange information so that everybody knows what is going on in the flagship and that uh, to advisory, uh, the advisory board uh, receives all the information needed to take decisions or make proposals to the European Commission. So, thank you for your attention. That was my talk. Thank you, Marcus. So now we welcome Professor Jürgen Linek. So thank you, Professor, for everything you achieved to put this flagship on shape together with the Commission. You want this one? So good morning, everybody. Can you hear me? Très bien. This is a European event, but we are in France. Donc, d'abord, merci beaucoup, Yves, uh, à toi et tes collègues pour organiser cette conférence ici à Grenoble. Merci. Applaudissements. 
Now, I was asked to say a few words uh, on this uh, Quenum initiative as former chairman of this high-level steering committee. So far, you have heard a lot of, uh, how can I say, formalities in a certain sense. Let's talk about our real business. That's science and innovation. Now, as uh, Tommaso said, I had the pleasure to spend a few days last week in the US, and I was in China previously. I was visiting MIT and Harvard, and then in Washington, NIST and the University of Maryland. And some of you know what kind of activities are going on there. My observation, science-wise, we are doing fine. We are extraordinarily doing fine in Europe. No problem with our science. If I compare what I know from Europe, science-wise, we are okay. MIT, Harvard, all these other places, they are not doing better science than we are doing in Europe. Science-wise, we are fine. Still, what I realized is the following. At MIT, they are creating a quantum center. The same at Harvard. At NIST and the University of Maryland, they have this joint quantum institute. But they not only have a joint quantum institute, they also have, in addition, a joint quantum computation institute, where mathematicians and computer scientists come together with people from a national institution like NIST. Many universities in the US start creating new positions because they know money will flow into that topic. Chicago, Stanford, all these places create two, three, four additional professorships for quantum technologies. In China, I was recently in Beijing, the city of China creates a quantum information academy for Beijing University and Tsinghua University. They put a building on place, probably 100 million euros, and then they support this activity just for the two universities, just the city of Beijing, with 30 million euros per year. Now, my question to you is, you come from all kinds of places around Europe at which of your universities there are additional, let's say, two or three positions for quantum information science or quantum technologies being created. Can you please hold up your hand? There is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, okay? That's uh, okay, but taking the size of Europe into account, it would be interesting later on to know those places. Maybe you can, you can tell me later on where this happens and how this worked, that more of this happens. Where are quantum centers being created at universities? Can you please hold up your fingers? to give me an idea. Don't be so shy. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Can you say where, just to get an idea? Delft. Where? Delft. Delft. Where else? Copenhagen. Copenhagen. Munich. Munich. Ireland. OK. That's it? I didn't get it acoustic. Ah, okay, Trento, go, okay. Paris, okay. Good, so, and there is uh, Vienna. Well, I could uh, somehow comment and say the usual suspects, there were already <laughs> something is, there is more, but maybe we need more of this all over Europe. Second observation, 
when I was visiting the startup of Chris Monroe, who was working on iron traps and trying to use irons as do some groups in Europe also very successfully uh, in his company, IronQ, 35 people, the company being operable since three years. He told me he was caught up by a venture capitalist from California. And then he got 20 million for the first three years to start up his company. Who among you was caught up by a venture capitalist from California or I don't know, Cambridge or you know, maybe China? Who, who was caught up? One, from where? Germany, which company or which venture capitalist? Okay, good. So one, one in whole Europe. Third remark, when I was visiting NIST and the DOE and people from the OSTP, they told me that in the US they are setting up uh, something that they call quantum, quantum Economic Development Consortium. This will be coordinated by NIST, that's the National Bureau of, of former National Bureau of Standards, National Institute of Science and Technology, run by the Department of Commerce and Stanford Research Institute. And the idea is to bring together up to 100 companies from all over the US, and there are also other companies that might be interested, you know, at the international level to contribute to come together, only companies, they have to pay a fee. Startups, let's say 10,000 euros a year and Google uh, 100,000 euro per year. They come together to set up something similar to what they have in the US under the name Semitech for the semiconductor industry. And as a matter of fact, I don't <coughs> see in Europe how Companies, and especially big companies, really come together and talk about, you know, some kind of roadmap also with respect to quantum technologies. Now, what are my messages? And in a certain sense, the question is, are I happy as a former chairman of the high-level steering committee how things evolve now after a couple of years? I'm happy that we starting the flagship, I'm happy that we have the conference here. I'm happy about the enthusiasm of the people being involved. That's great. I'm happy about the science. But we need to have more national activities. We have to compete internationally. There will be open positions worldwide. And we have to avoid that Yes, especially young people here in Europe take on positions in the US or elsewhere because we are not competitive at, at this level. So we really have to make sure that also nationally at the universities there is action. This is point one. This also includes, by the way, curricula. We have to really start setting up curricula on quantum engineering and so forth to work on the workforce that we need later on once we are really uh, on the way. And the second point that uh, really disturbs me is the lack of involvement of companies at the European level. There must happen more. And I don't know whether the situation in other countries is different, for example, in the US, because there is pressure from the DOE and the Department of Defense to do more, also in the sense of pioneering fields that are of relevant to national security at the end. I don't know, maybe that plays a role. But what we definitely have to do, and this was one of the major and is one of the major goals, and I'm looking to Gustav of this flagship, at the end, to contribute to wealth creation, to contribute to a new technology, a new industry sector starting from startups and also large companies. 
So during these days, I would really appreciate also when you discuss among yourselves and also with the representatives from the companies here how we deal with this issue. From my viewpoint, we need more activities at the national level. The EU has done its work and we need more involvement from the private sector to really make sure that there will be an industrial base in the future for what we are doing in science. So that's uh, my message to you. In that sense, uh, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm somehow happy, but you know, and that's why I gave these international examples. The heat is on. We are not alone. There are other countries that really act strategically at the national level, big nations like the US and especially China, and we have to get our act together, not only with respect to science, but with respect to innovation to stay competitive. So let's work on that. I'm looking forward to interesting discussions during these days. And again, thank you very much, Eve, for having organized this. Thank you. So thank you. So now we have the best possible panel to discuss, to discuss these critical issues. Yes, first question, Hervé. Hi, Enrique Solano again. Um, Apart from my duties in Bilbao, Spain, I am creating an international institute on quantum computing and quantum artificial intelligence in Shanghai University. Uh, and I'm a little worried about the numbers I see because only the city of Shanghai has invested more than 500 million euros this year. Uh, and to my knowledge, Hefe University is investing several billions of US dollars in a computing, quantum computing center where very likely they will hire several thousands of quantum computing experts. And the numbers I have seen are really modest uh, in compared to what is, is, is I think, uh, public know-how. And uh, the way the companies in China are approaching um, is uh, different. Uh, I'm negotiating, I will not mention the names, but several millions of euros to create labs. Alibaba has invested in Shanghai branch of Hefei University uh, uh, a 12 qubit quantum computer with superconducting circuits, which is not working really well, but but it is a lot of Huawei, etc. So, so the uh, the city investments are uh, already comparable to the whole European flagship. So that's, I think, the level of, of involvement that we should uh, aim at. Well, that makes the situation not better for Europe. But thanks for adding those numbers. They are different scales, not to talk about what China invests in this field as a whole. Um, I mean, it's clear that uh, quantum technologies has become uh, a focus of interest of uh, the most developed economies and the uh, amounts that are being poured there are substantial. Um, I'm not saying that uh, for the moment uh, here in uh, Europe we are at the same level, but uh, we should not overlook two aspects. First. If you sum up all the investments we do in Europe, from commission side plus national side, we already have uh, uh, in Horizon 20 uh, more than uh, the billion. I mean, we have uh, a couple of hundred million from union funding. If you look into the different countries that have their own, um, we, we come close to that. We're now discussing for the next framework program, Horizon Europe, another billion f for the flagship alone. Move into digital Europe program, we are talking about a couple of more billion. So it's clear that uh, on European level, we have uh, the ambition to ramp it up, to, to move ahead, to come to comparable levels as the others. But they are fully agree with what uh, Jürgen said. Uh, we need more now also from the national sides. We see more and more countries developing their own quantum programs and uh, starting to invest, but uh, we would be happy to see more of that. Uh, and then in addition to just running the, the projects, we really have to see that all initiatives that are created uh, work together on a common roadmap. It doesn't help us if each country in the union, we all trying to do the same thing at different scales. We have to bring the things uh, together. Uh, I happen to have the experience of high-performance computing where the debates were exactly the same 
And I keep telling my colleagues in quantum, we are now where we are in HPC three, four years ago. Might be we're going the same route, but uh, we have a growing understanding at all levels that if we want really to be successful in this uh, uh, technology, we have to invest more, but we have to invest more together and in a coherent way. Okay. Yeah, I, I mean, I just want to give some comments for the previous uh, question. I, I mean, there are many kind of local governments in China, they, they support quantum research, but for the money from Shanghai, it's, it, it's not started yet. Yeah, we are planning, but there is no money yet. <laughs> and yeah, yes, Hefei, yeah, yeah, yeah I, I'm from China, I'm from Shanghai. Yeah, yeah the, the money is not here yet. We are still debating. But uh, for the money from Hefei, yes, there are. And we are, we are still waiting for the federal government's money, like the flagship, yeah. And for the quantum computer uh, supported by Alibaba, uh, you, you can visit you know, through the website, yeah. But probably that I, I don't know I don't know about the, the experience. Maybe not as good as IBM. Yeah. Thank you for your comment. Thank you for your comment. Other question? Sorry. Thank you. So I've been in the AI space for the last eight nine years, and a lot of the people I've hired have been physicists. CERN's been a very fruitful place to hire away from. And the salaries that we pay are significantly higher than what they were earning before. What are the incentives that QFLY can provide to bring in talent as you're educating out and scaling out the expertise? Maybe, maybe I can start also uh, with respect to the comment by our, our Chinese uh, 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 colleague. Of course, money is one thing, and if you have more resources and more money, you can do more, but it's not you know, everything. Maybe with respect to the innovative aspect of our work, we have to think more of supporting entrepreneurial activities among those who are in the business also in Europe. Young people to support them starting their company, that's this issue of venture capital. Uh, maybe we have to find other ways in Europe to support these, these type of activities. And in addition, creating some kind of awareness, as I said, among the private sector for that area. Because even if there are billions of, of dollars in a country like China, you have to set up an infrastructure, you need the workforce, and it's not evident that this is there right away. So I would say Europe is not so bad off also in that respect. We just have to work on our deficits. With respect to your remark, uh, workforce, uh, labor market, of course, in many countries in Europe, there is full employment in, 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 in a certain sense. So uh, the private sector is, is looking for, you know, engineers, uh, physicists, and so forth. Um, again, I would say if there are interesting tasks for young people in the research areas, either in large research uh, organizations or in universities or in companies, um, salaries at the end are okay. These this are not Google salaries from the Bay Area. This is different in Europe. But I would say that's not an issue at the moment. Okay. So based on these numbers comparisons, which specifically in the quantum computing space, you get a lot. Maybe, so let me share the attitude I have towards them. And this is based on the observation that right after the flagship was first announced, a relatively small German car company that starts with a P announced that within three years they wanted to invest 1.5 billion euros into batteries. And we know how batteries work. So I think we are seeing that true industrial development is working at a 
much larger scale, even for smaller tasks. So I think our understanding should rather be that what we are doing here is preparing the ground for serious industrial development, be it in existing companies or be it in um, companies that we have to start ourselves. Because those work at different scale. We see in China that these we are partially quoting industrial investments, and we know the industry government relations in China are different than in ours. So this is already the next level. So what we, um, the flagship, should say is that we are building prototypes that convince the industry to take over um, at a certain step um, based on volume that can be generated. And this is also where graduates, so my graduates, do not have difficulty to actually find meaningful industry jobs. When I graduated, industry jobs for physicists were in consulting firms, but now my graduates can go into quantum computing companies and do exactly what they are trained for, not what they're trained for on a meta level, but what they are really trained for, it's a meaningful job. And I think this is a goal uh, that we can have and that is commensurate with uh, other funding announcements. Um, I view the mindset we are having a little bit like analogous or that we had maybe two years ago as that of the Americans right after the Sputnik shock so we have seen that in other countries and in other jurisdictions, people are, have le leapt forward, but if the history of space flight and this analogy, we are the Americans, has taught us that after a few leaps around the block, we might as well I be take over if we have the endurance. So despite the gloom that has been coming here, um, I would like people to be optimistic. I'm quite happy you made this very uh, positive uh, statement. Um, now, one possibility, I mean, that's what we've seen in other areas. If uh, you take an example like uh, the Excel joint undertaking, which was created already quite a while ago, where you see the uh, investment that is being made by the industrials. I mean, we, it's like one billion funding from public sources, leverage factor one to four from the, the private sector, just within the joint undertaking, and then you add all the additional investments that the private sector is doing outside the, um, the Excel. It's, for me, I mean, conceivable that in the future we would have a similar setting for quantum. I'm not saying that's the way it will go at the end, but years ago there was uh, a political uh, will and there was a support by all actors, be it research, be it uh, private sector, to create what was coined at the time as the Airbus of microelectronics or the, the Airbus chip or whatever. So we really managed to create a platform where you had all the actors to, uh, together that actively work on a common uh, purpose, be it uh, science driven, be it uh, industrial driven, be it market driven, uh, addressing similar questions. At we're now having within the flagship. Now there we have a very well established structure. I'm not saying we'll get the same in quantum, it might not be necessary, it might not be wanted, but that's a platform where indeed all those issues that you, you have addressed and that uh, also Jürgen so uh, nicely highlighted have a good uh, discussion platform and you can work together in addressing them. Don't forget that in those joint undertakings you have the, the commission, you have the member states and you have the industry as uh, equal partners working together on an agenda that includes from basic science up to something like manufacturing. So, I would like to add something. I mean, it's not all about money. You know, the Chinese have an infinite amount of money. No. <laughs> the Chinese have a virtually infinite amount of money. Kike, are you doing this? Have you ever done this for money? No. What is the incentive that we provide? I mean, I don't want to contradict what my colleagues said, but uh, we do have something uh, which is of high value, which is passion. What we do, most of us do because we really like it. Because, uh, I mean, 
There is blood in this. It's not just how much money you pump into something. This is how this whole thing came to be. And, you know, I think that uh, even without infinite resources, our resources are significant. And uh, here in Europe, we do have something which uh, in the US they are trying to build and elsewhere they do not necessarily have, which is a very strong community of passionate people, both in science and industry, which want to do this. Um, and for me, I mean, yes, of course it's challenging, but the other day I was at ICFO in Barcelona, and in the entrance there is a big picture of Nelson Mandela which a quote, with a quote which is attributed to him, but is actually not from him, as I found out. It's from Pliny the Elder, the guy who died in the Vesuvius eruption, and it says something very simple, which I think applies to us being here today, and it will also apply to us in Europe in the years ahead for quantum. And it is very simple, it says, it always seems impossible until it's done. A final comment from my side. So <clears throat> I'm coming from the field of photonics where a well-established industry is uh, already present and uh, I'm new to this field of quantum. My feeling is that uh, in European companies, on one hand, they think don't miss the boat, so follow what is going on, but uh, on the other hand, they are not fully committed yet to invest in the area. And uh, I think it's one of the major tasks of QFLAG to drag in more industry into this initiative. So we have taken that on our action item list. Then. Any other question or comment? Maybe. Yes, Hervé. Thank you. Uh, Chris Kotmark from the University of Geneva. Um, so maybe it was because I was in the back and I didn't see well, but when uh, people answered um, Professor Munich's question, it seemed there were more centers created than actually new positions. So um, could you uh, please discuss on, with this whole QFLAG um, scheme, is it more about growing the quantum sphere horizontally or vertically, let's say? Well, I'm, uh, I'm not sure whether I really understand your question. Maybe we can discuss this uh, later on. I want to come back to what uh, Tommaso said. Of course, he is absolutely right. And this discussion should have, let's say, a negative twist. Passion is great. And we are all passionate about what we are doing. But still, we are also here to talk about the next steps and also about what we can improve. And um, again, l l let me ask, who is here from the private sector representing companies? Okay. Well, now it's hard to say whether this is only one company <laughs> <laughs> or whether each end is a different company, but still, who is here from companies having a turnover above 100 million euros? Okay, fine. That's not that bad. No, I'm, I'm, bad I'm, 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 I'm really surprised because I was wondering, Eve, when I saw the view graph with the sponsors, that if I take, for example, Germany, not companies like Zeiss or Bosch or, you know, this company starting with a V that spent nearly 30 billion euros on paying fine for some other stuff uh, that they would and still survived. Imagine what they could have done with the 30 billion, not only in battery research, but also on quantum technology. But, but that's a different story. So. That's fine that the private sector is here. And my point is, 
The flagship is about science, but also on innovation, technologies, and, you know, new jobs. And this is something maybe that we can also discuss during the next day, whether we really are here already at the end of what we can do, or whether we find, you know, also other ways to bring the private sector closer together in terms of are they really talking to each other, not only nationally, maybe even not nationally, and European, and how is this, you know, somehow integrated into the scientific efforts. I think that's really a crucial, from my viewpoint, a crucial next stop. As I said, I don't worry about passion and science. That's, that's not the issue here from my viewpoint. Maybe a small comment. I work in the room, large companies, I discuss with them. Some are really active in the field, but other one send people just to look around what is going on. And if, if they should go active in the quantum technology, I think that's really important also. I can give you the name of these companies thereafter if you want. So we have both actors and people asking themselves, should we be active now in quantum technologies? Because it may be important for our technologies and markets. So except there is a last question. I think you each deserve a coffee break. Uh, we will be back here in half an hour at 11.40. The coffee break is on the ground floor. Thanks to each of you. Thank you, Thank you again.